I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. Pro-life pregnancy centers score a victory in court. A judge strikes down New York City's local law 17. We'll have the latest. Plus, it's that time of year again. We'll preview Williamsburg's annual Feast of the Giglio. It's a good alternative for people from the neighborhood who can't afford to go away for vacation. They have a way of coming out with the kids for a couple of hours every night and doing something pretty unique. And hamburgers, hot dogs, and prudence? Prudence, for, for lack of better terms, it's knowing what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. Um, or if we're talking about our actions, it's knowing what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Well, good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. Well, to paraphrase a now infamous billboard, is the most dangerous place for a pro-life pregnancy center New York City? Well, just one day before a law changing the way such centers do business would have gone into effect, a federal judge has ruled and his answer is a resounding no. Judge William Pauley issuing an order blocking uh, the New York City Council from enforcing its pregnancy service center law, better known as Local Law 17. Uh, the law ordered pregnancy centers, uh, pregnancy care centers rather, to make mandatory disclosures about their services, including posting signs informing clients that the clinics do not make abortion referrals or provide birth control. While the law's supporters say they were just looking for what they call truth in advertising from the crisis pregnancy centers. But the centers, though, which would have faced heavy fines and possible closures if that law went into effect, say that the law was an attack on their guaranteed right to free speech. And in a big victory, the centers won. To discuss yesterday's decision, I'm joined now on the phone by Chris Slattery, the founder of Expected Mother Care and one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit against the city. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. It's great to be on. Well, first of all, uh, what uh, exactly did the judge say and what was your initial reaction to it? The judge issued an order, which is a preliminary injunction, uh, basically arguing that the, on the merits of this case, if it were to proceed, uh, he believes that uh, the there is a great necessity to issue an order blocking the law because it's clear to him that the law impinges on the First and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution. Therefore, uh, you know, there is in effect an emergency that has to take place uh, blocking and preventing the, the usurpation of our civil rights sure. and of course we're outstandingly pleased uh, we we are thrilled that uh, the judge listened to the excellent arguments of our attorneys with the American Center for Law and Justice and the Alliance Defense Fund and all the arguments we made to the uh, unhearing city council members over a long period from last October well, now they've heard what we've been saying was true. We argued these points uh, vociferously with them, and uh, it went on deaf ears. There wasn't a single city council member or a single staff member of a single council member who ever took the trouble to visit, talk with the doctors, the hospitals, uh, the counselors, the staff of a single center in a single location in the entire city of New York. These people were not interested in the truth of what we do. They weren't interested in our rights. Uh, as Mayor Bloomberg summed it up, he said, well, I don't know when he was about to sign the bill. I don't know if it's constitutional or not, but I'm going to sign it anyway because I'm pro-choice. Right. Well, that's not how we make laws in our society. Right. Well, of course, this, uh, this court fight uh, doesn't come without a price. How, how are you guys handling financing uh, the, the legal fight here? Well, we've had our legal uh, work generously donated by these two public interest law firms. Hmm. But it has taken a substantial amount of our time in, um, in dealing with uh, our lawyers, in dealing with the lobbying, in dealing with uh, the media, um, and, and raising the funds uh, to continue uh, to exist. I mean, there were some people that doubted uh, that what we were doing was right. Mm. There were some that didn't support us. There were some that criticized us, that uh, we should go along with the city, uh, that, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a futile effort to fight City Hall. 
Sure. So, Spe and Speaker and so Quinn, with, and Speaker know. Quinn even now says that that the city will uh, appeal this judge's decision. What are the next steps for EMC in in your legal fight on on your behalf? Well, we're going to uh, see the city attorneys and and our attorneys uh, try to negotiate uh, a a truce here, if you will, a settlement, uh, a permanent injunction uh, that would basically uphold the judge's decision. Uh, we, we, this is three for three on these kind of laws. There are two laws that federal judges overturned in Maryland in January and in March of this year. Uh, they have the, the tide going against them. And if the city wants to fight and appeal on this, it's going to be a long, expensive battle. And I'm afraid that may be the route they're going to take, because for them, this is all political. This is about appeasing the abortion industry in New York and and trying to un relentlessly crush us. All right. Well, Chris uh, Slattery, the founder of Expected Mother Care Pro-Life Pregnancy Centers, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today. Once again, really appreciate it. And we'll, of course, continue to follow the story and keep in touch with you. Thanks for covering the story so well, Matt. Well, thank you, Chris. We really appreciate your time. Well, okay, uh, our, our producers reached out to the offices of uh, City Council Speaker Christine Quinn and Councilwoman Jessica Lappin, both major supporters of the law, and they gave us the following statements. Speaker Quinn said, quote, the court's decision is deeply disappointing and is a disservice to women. We will not waver in our fight for New York City women and we will immediately appeal today's ruling. She says, furthermore, actions that the judge recommended that the city take as an alternative to the law are completely unworkable and would create even more legal problems, end quote. And Councilwoman Jessica Lappin said, quote, the judge got it wrong. I'm disappointed but not discouraged. We will persevere in our efforts to protect women from these dangerous and deceptive practices and appeal. Well, of course, as I uh, just told uh, Chris Slattery there, we will have, uh, continue to, of course, follow this story as it works its way through the court system. But uh, we will, of course, have all of the latest details as they emerge. Well, stay with us. A major report on clergy sex abuse is released. This time, it is in Ireland. We'll have that story and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, it's a backyard barbecue that's about more than just food. First though, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, thousands of mourners flocked to Borough Park, Brooklyn last night for the funeral of Leby Kletsky. The police uh, recovered the dismembered remains of the eight-year-old Orthodox Jewish boy on Wednesday morning. Commissioner Ray Kelly has said that the man uh, charged with the killing named Levi Aaron was given a, has given a written confession now. Investigators used surveillance video to trace the missing boy to Aaron. In other local news, the website The Daily Caller reporting New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg gave big money to the four Republican state senators who voted to legalize same-sex marriage. The website reporting Bloomberg, a same-sex marriage supporter, gave $10,300. That's the maximum allowable amount to the re-election campaign coffers of Senators James Alisi, Mark Gristani, Roy McDonald, and Stephen Saland after the vote last month. Democratic State Senator Ruben Diaz, an outspoken opponent of same-sex marriage, accused the four of selling their votes. A source has told the New York Daily News that Bloomberg also gave the same donation amount to Democratic State Senator Joseph Adabo, who voted against legalizing same-sex marriage in 2009, but voted for it this time around. Well, as the investigation into media giant News Corp continues, there are questions about whether its CEO, Rupert Murdoch, should return or be stripped of his papal knighthood. Murdoch is a Knight Commander of St. Gregory the Great. Catholic News Agency reporting Murdoch, who is not Catholic, was recommended for the honor in 1998 by then Los Angeles Archbishop Cardinal Roger Mahoney. The fallout from the scandal continuing across the Atlantic, meantime, the Church of England says it may sell its $6 million share of News Corp. An advisory group for the church says that it told News Corp officials that charges against the company are, quote, utterly reprehensible and unethical. The FBI has opened an investigation into whether News Corp tried to hack the phones of September 11th victims. Well, meanwhile, the Irish government is demanding answers from the Vatican after a report showed the church mishandled sex abuse by clergy. A report released yesterday said the Holy See opposed Irish bishops' 1996 guidelines on handling sexual abuse of children by priests. 
Ireland's foreign minister met today with the country's papal nuncio to demand a formal response from the Vatican. Turning now to India, where Catholic bishops remembered the victims of bombings in Mumbai yesterday that killed at least 21 people. More than 130 others were injured in the blast. In a statement, the bishops expressed condolences for the family members of those killed. The bishops also remembered those being treated at hospitals. The Indian Bishops Conference president told Vatican Radio that the attacks have brought out the best in citizens. Well, back in this country, the Bishop of Toledo, Ohio, is clarifying a statement he made about donations to a breast cancer foundation. Bishop Leonard Blair said last week that donations raised under Catholic auspices, like parochial schools, should not go toward the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Foundation. Now, Blair was concerned that the foundation is open to embryonic stem cell research and donates to Planned Parenthood. Blair said individual Catholics may still donate based on the foundation's assurance that no local funds go to Planned Parenthood or to fund embryonic stem cell research. Well, churches, synagogues, and mosques across the U.S. have announced they will devote one weekend later this year to educating their members about the DREAM Act. Senator Dick Durbin was joined this week by bishops, priests, rabbis, ministers, and an imam in announcing September 23rd through the 25th as DREAM Act Sabbath. The weekend will be devoted to educating people about the faith-based reasons for supporting the act, which gives young illegal immigrants who meet certain criteria a legal path to citizenship. Meanwhile, an Alabama congressman is taking a lot of heat for comments he made about illegal immigrants. As your congressman on the House floor, I'll do anything short of shooting them. Anything that is lawful, it needs to be done because illegal aliens need to quit taking jobs from American citizens. That is Alabama Congressman Mo Brooks there. The head of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus criticized him for what he called Brooks' re rhetoric referencing acts of violence. Well, from Texas, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which promotes the separation of church and state, is suing Governor Rick Perry. The foundation says Perry's connection to an August 6 prayer event is unconstitutional. Perry has promoted the day of prayer and fasting and has asked other governors to join him. A spokesperson for Perry says the lawsuit will not affect plans for the event. Well, supporters held a mass this week in Caracas, Venezuela to pray for the recovery of President Hugo Chavez. Attendees prayed for Chavez as he battles cancer. In an interview, Chavez said he has a tumor the size of a baseball in his pelvic area. He says that he may need radiation or chemotherapy. And mourners remembered former First Lady Betty Ford at a funeral service in Michigan today. It happened at Grace Episcopal Church in Grand Rapids. Ford died last week of natural causes. She was 93 years old. She'll be laid to rest next to her husband, President Gerald Ford, at his museum. Well, stay with us. There is much more Currents ahead. Coming up, what's the dealio with the Giglio? The pageant really reenacts the uh, heroic act of St. Paulinus, who saved the children of his town uh, in the 5th century. Welcome back. Well, Italian pride is taking center stage on the streets of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, once again. For over 100 years, residents and the curious alike cram into the streets and the sidewalks to take part in the annual, ever-popular Feast of the Giglio. It happens every year at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Parish, and the highlight is a unique dance in the streets. Well, to get a preview of the festivities and to find out more about them, I'm joined now in studio by Mount Carmel's pastor, Monsignor Joseph Calise, and one of the event's organizers, Dr. Phil Franco. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being here. Really thanks appreciate it. Thanks for inviting it. us. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to have you back again. Talk about the Giglio. I can't believe it's already time for the Giglio again. It seems like this comes around sooner and sooner every year. Time flies, you know. But, but for us, um, it's a year-long event. Well, there you go, and I, and I know because last year, you know, when I when I got uh, the, uh, the the tar beat out of me at this uh, wrestling event that you guys had last year, last Feb not this past February, but February before, I know you came up to me and you said we're already getting ready for the for the uh, Giglio, and you got to come out and, and see how we're doing building the thing. So I know this is a lot of preparation that goes into it. Feast of the Giglio has already been going on here. How are things going so far? Oh, they're going really well. Uh, we've been blessed with good weather. We had one bad night of rain last Friday, but other than that, we've had some really cool evenings and some tremendous crowds. We had to have close to 2,000 people there last night. Wow. 
That's amazing. Well, again, that was going to be one of my questions too, is, is the, the hot weather we've been having keeping people away, but it doesn't sound like it. No, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. It's a good alternative for people from the neighborhood who can't afford to go away for vacation. Yeah. They have a way of coming out with the kids for a couple of hours every night and doing something pretty unique. I love it. It's a staycation. Yeah. I, li I like it a lot. Well, Dr. Franco, tell us a little bit, if you will, about kind of the background, the history of this uh, feast and, and some of the unique aspects of it. Well, uh, a lot of people think when they think of Italian feasts, they have a tendency to think that they're all the same. You know, they think about sausage and peppers and uh, zeppoli and things like that. And of course, we have those great things, but what really makes our feast unique is the dance that you mentioned, the dance of the Giglio and the boat. Uh, the Giglio is a tremendous 80-foot, uh, four-ton structure that's carried by approximately 100 men through the streets. Uh, and the pageant, really, as you mentioned, it dances through the streets. It's danced by the men uh, with a full band on top. And the pageant really reenacts the uh, heroic act of St. Paulinus, who saved the children of his town uh, in the fifth century. And so the people celebrated by building towers. Uh, Giglio means lily. And they built towers of lilies to honor him for his heroic act. So uh, that really sets us apart from anything else you've ever seen, and it's a great spectacle. It is amazing. It's a beautiful sight mm -hmm. to behold. I'll tell yeah. you, and a lot of people have, have of course, a lot of fun uh, at, the, at the dance and throughout the, uh, the feast. Absolutely. Um, so one dance happened, I know, this past week. Still got another one coming up, but tell us a little about that. Yes, this past week was uh, Giglio Sunday, it's called, and traditionally uh, that's when we dance both the Giglio and the boat. This coming Sunday, if you, if you missed it, you have a chance to see uh, the great event again. Uh, this Sunday is called Old Timers Day, and uh, essentially it's, it's very similar to the previous Sunday. Uh, you get to see the dance of the Giglio, which is something that you, you really can't describe. It's something you have to experience. Um, but the difference is on Old Timers Day, a lot of the old-time capos, the gentlemen who were responsible for organizing the feast back in the 50s, the 60s, uh, and even maybe in some cases before that, uh, they get to conduct the lifts and they get to be kind of center stage that day. Uh, so it's, it's great in that sense as well. That's, that's wonderful. Mm. Well, uh, of course, uh, Bishop DiMarzio will, I know, be a part of things this coming uh, week as well. Tell us a little bit about uh, the masses that will be taking place on uh, Sunday. On Saturday. On Saturday, right. Saturday yeah. is the actual feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So as our patronal feast, we have masses most of the day. We'll start with midnight mass, and that will be followed by a rosary. We have mass at 8 in the morning. Bishop DiMarzio will come for mass at 10. <laughs> then there will be another mass early afternoon, and at 3 o'clock, Bishop Cajano's coming for Mass. Nice. And then there'll be Mass in the evening, believe it or not, in English, Polish, Spanish, and Creole. Wow. The Italian Mass will be earlier in the day. So we have a full line of Masses going on up until 8 o'clock at night. Wow. Both Bishop DiMarzio's Mass and Bishop Cajano's will be followed by a procession through the street where the statue of the Blessed Mother, as Our Lady of Mount Carmel, will be riding on a float and we'll go through the streets handing out scapulars and inviting people to pray with us. That's amazing. Well, it sounds like a wonderful time. Of course, it is an Italian feast b traditionally, but it sounds like a very multicultural time, multicultural event here. It's, uh, you know, I, in, you're in New York, so th it, that's bound to happen. So and you're uh, in Williamsburg. There you go. So right around Williamsburg where the Spanish population is growing, with Bedford Avenue, there's a whole, whole culture coming in from all over the United mm -hmm. States who love traditions, who love pageants and festivals. Sure. You know, there's that little reputation that maybe the new people in the neighborhood aren't going to like it. Yeah. They love it. Sure. Because it's historical value, it's cultural value. Yeah. Well, it's, and it, it's a wonderful time. Really quick, before we have to wrap things up here, Monsignor, I wanted to ask you, I know there's been this, uh, this sort of issue that's uh, been kind of a bigger issue than maybe it should have been at Our Lady of Mount Carmel with this uh, state assemblyman, um, Assemblyman Lentall, who gave some money to the parish school that was given back after the bishop uh, gave a, a directive to uh, parishes to do that if uh, a state lawmaker gave money after the, the gay marriage vote. What's been kind of the response from the community? Anything new to report there? Well, there's been a lot of response from the community. It's been, um, as you could imagine, mixed. I've gotten a lot of emails uh, that were against the decision, a lot of emails that were for the decision. Uh, several people send checks in, mm -hmm. feeling that we did the right thing, sending the check back to Assemblyman Lentol, but feeling that they wanted to make up the difference rather than the parish. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is it was blown out of its proportion. Uh, it's become an issue of same-sex marriage and homophobia, and that's never what it was. It was simply a matter of the bishop sent out a directive, and I obeyed it. Sure. 
or the, the boss says jump, you got to say how, uh, how high, sir, you know? There you go. Well, uh, Monsignor Calise and also uh, Dr. Phil Franco, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate your time. Both thank, of you. You. thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, stay with us. There is more Currents coming up. Coming up, what's the dealio with the Giglio? The pageant really reenacts the uh, heroic act of St. Paulinus, who saved the children of his town uh, in the 5th century. And finally tonight, if you flip through the pages of the Oxford Dictionary, the self-proclaimed world's most trusted dictionary, and you land on the definition for the word prudence, you find the following, and I quote, it is the quality of being prudent or cautiousness. Not really much of a definition, is it? But maybe exa some examples would help here. Okay, so uh, for instance, it would be prudent to make backups of your computer files. It would be prudent to, uh, say, study before a big test. And it would be prudent to attend the Office of Faith Formation's Grilling with God talk on, yes, prudence. Now, if you were imprudent and uh, just happened to miss last night's talk, don't worry, our cameras were there. Uh, local priest, Father James Car Caroli, uh, weighed in, and uh, he uh, weighed in on the trait that, that we would all be really, I guess, prudent to possess. Tonight, we will have a word of the day. And the word of the day is the word prudence. Tonight we're here with Grilling with God, sponsored by the Office of Faith Formation, and we're with our guest speaker, Father Caroli, who will speak about Catholic prudence. I think this is a nice environment. People are comfortable here. Uh, we're just barbecuing and having a talk. It looks like we might get a little shower, but I think it'll be fine. We'll let the Holy Spirit do what she does. Today the topic is our Christian responsibility and using the gift of prudence. Prudence, for, for lack of better terms, it's knowing what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. Um, or if we're talking about our actions, it's knowing what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And in a very specific way tonight, I will be speaking about the need for prudence, especially when it comes to our technology, the internet and cell phones and uh, those things. We all know stories of politicians who have ruined their careers because of something that they sent on a text message. We have all heard stories about marriages falling apart because of things that are happening on the internet. But we're talking about something more serious here. We are also talking about our souls. There are certain things uh, that we should not be looking at when it comes to the internet. Um, and so when we don't have Christ with us, even when we're turning on the computer and asking God to be with us in that time, uh, we can look at objects and look at things that drive us away from, away from Christ. The prudent person has the plan and sticks to it no matter what. And so on a Sunday morning when you're exhausted and you're tired and the last thing you want to do is get into your car and come to church, the prudent person says, this is my obligation, it's in the schedule, I have to get to church. And the example he gave, one could also say, well maybe I'm that tired that I could cause an accident going to Sunday Mass. I wish I was more prudent, I think I... I need to be more prudent, and I'm going to, um, I hope that what he said tonight sticks with me. Even in giving examples of prudence, we can be imprudent in the way we communicate the example. So uh, I enjoyed that interchange very, very much. Pope Benedict talks about moral relativism. I think it's really important for us to stay true to our morals and ethics, and hopefully through that to remain to be prudent people. Um, but it is a challenge. I know Christ dwells within me guiding me whenever and whatever I do or say anything. A light of which I caught no glimmer of before comes to me at the very moment when it is needed. In other words, be prudent. You know, I, I think sadly for myself, uh, the word prudent in particular um, is not necessarily prudence, the word, but prudent, the, the other form of the word. Uh, my closest like recollection or reference to it was actually from Saturday Night Live. You remember back uh, when George H.W. Bush was president and Dana Carvey did the impression, you know, wouldn't be prudent, not, not Ganda, you know, that whole thing. Uh, yeah, so sadly, I think that's uh, my familiar familiarity with the word prudent 
uh, goes about that far. But this is a much better one, this uh, reference to it, and much more applicable to our daily lives. I love it. Well, uh, that is it for this edition of Currents, and I will do no more presidential impersonations. But be sure and join us tomorrow as we bid farewell to the witches and wizards of Hogwarts. Until then, though, be sure and visit us online over at CurrentsNY.net. Go there and watch selected reports and full broadcasts of the show. You can also friend us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter as well. Our Twitter handle is at CurrentsNY. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great night.